Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. One of the things God is doing in these last days is that he's given the church a total package. Jesus is coming soon. In Acts chapter 3, from verse 12 to 21, after Peter did, they, they just did a miracle over a young man and people were gathered and they said, Jesus, whom heaven must hold back, will return. But before he returns, there must be a restitution, a restoration of all things. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace will sanctify you completely, your spirit, your soul, and your body. So God has a total package for the church in these last days. It's addressing your spirit, it's addressing your soul, and it's addressing your physical body. In these last days, we want to see a repeat of Psalm 104. That in the nation of Israel, none was feeble, none was sick. It's raising hell with people, addressing all manner of sicknesses in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So, God in these last days is addressing, he has a total package for the church and he's addressing both the spirit, the soul, and the mortal body. Everything is being addressed. Like I said in Acts chapter 3 from verse 12 to 21, it says, Jesus whom heaven must hold back. So, he wants to come, but heaven is holding him back. Why? He said, until the restitution, the restoration of all things. Everything must be addressed in the life of the saints. Not just emotional healing, but physical, emotional, spiritual. They must be whole. Otherwise, Jesus will not come. He's coming for a triumphant church. He's coming for a church that is holy and not beggarly. He's coming for a church that is rich and not filthy. He's coming for a church that is holy, that is prosperous, that is peaceful, that is victorious, that is triumphant. It's a total package. Now, we must also understand that in this total package, there are things you must do. Now, we looked sometime last week at somebody who got a total package in Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 19 to 34, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all, every other thing you need in life will be given unto you. Now let me explain something about the word of God. The word of God um, gives us different levels of glory and each one with its price to pay. For example, it tells us in 1 Corinthians uh, 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 chapter 12. He said there are different gifts of the Spirit. And he mentioned nine gifts of the Spirit. Then he tells you as a person, covet the best gift you need in life. Depending on your call and your assignment, covet the best gift. Now, one of the ways to covet gifts is to associate with people who have that gift. And gifts are transmitted through association, environment, and influence, which I give an example of Elijah and Elisha. As Elisha was following Elijah, he got the double portion of the anointing on Elijah. So that association brought the gifts of Elijah to rest on Elisha. In Acts 4, when they saw the apostles that they were bold, they took note that they'd been with Jesus, meaning the boldness they saw on Jesus, they saw on timid Peter, James, and John. The anointing, the gifts had been transmitted through association, environment, and influence. And it works like that spiritually. So the Bible says you can covet gifts through environment, association, and influence. But in 1 Corinthians 13, let, let me show you a better way to covet gifts. It says walk in love. So if you walk in love, every single gift you need will be automatically added unto you. 
Another example we have in 1 John chapter 1, it says that if we say we have no sin, we'll tell lies, say we are liars. He said, but if we confess our sins to God the Father, he's faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all manner of unrighteousness. Meaning, you have to confess your sins, both the ones you know and the ones you don't know. Now the question is, how do you even know about certain sins you've committed that you're not even aware that they are sins? So another more excellent way, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Now this is a higher level of glory. And everything that is needed in your life, God will address it, including sins. And that's why First John, if you go further, he says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, and we have fellowship one with another, he says, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sins. Meaning, you don't have to confess any sin. Once you walk in the revelation of what God is doing at every point in time, and you back it by walking in love. He said, there is no sin you commit in this life. Whether you ask for forgiveness or not, he said, you'll be cleansed, you'll be forgiven. That's much better because if I have to confess and I don't remember some sins and I don't confess, they'll be retained. But if I just walk in light and I walk in love, all sins will be cleansed. So the word gives you different levels of glory. Now you can go to God and say, you need this, you need that, you need this, you need that. But it says in Matthew 6, if you just seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, he said everything you need, including what you are not aware of, will be added unto you. That's a better level of glory. Now, we want to look at a few examples of a few people who enjoy this wonderful privilege. I call it a privilege wonderful gifting, wonderful grace from God, which, you know, Hosea 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So much grace from God. In Titus, I think 2.11, it says, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. So the grace is available. You just need the knowledge, which is the confession of Jesus being the sovereign Lord and Savior of your life to assess that grace. That's why Romans 5 says that we connect the grace through faith. So there's so much grace available, but then you must know what to do to connect the grace. There is wave, um, is it telephone waves or so? There's wave all over the atmosphere, but you need a SIM that is registered. You need a phone to connect that wave and take advantage of it. Now, you don't have to travel from Lagos to London or New York to tell someone somebody, to tell something to someone. You want to talk to your mom or your aunt or your uncle, they're out of there, and there's a grace. That grace, it's available meaning, there's a means to talk to them, but then there's something you must do. Get the SIM, register it, put some credit on it, put a phone and call. You can't see the wavelength, but it exists. The grace of God is invisible, but it exists. And it brings to you a total package. It is available, but it's invisible. It exists. Now, the question is, what do you do to assess it? Now, the first example we have about seeking first the kingdom of God is in Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, I read from verse 3 to 9. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, or spike not very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. There were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor and the murmured against her. Now let me say something about the poor. And this one mistake people make. They believe giving needs, necessities to the poor is the same as ministering to God. It's not the same. I just want to say this in passing. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, if I bestow all my goods to the poor 
and have not love, it says it profited me nothing. So the question is, what is love? Love is not given to the poor. That sounds surprising. If love was given to the poor, then they wouldn't ask for love after you give all your goods to the poor. Meaning, the fact that you give all your goods to the poor does not put you in the good books of God. You may give your goods to the poor and still have issues with God, unresolved issues with God. And you may give your goods to the poor and be in the good books of God. Now, giving to the poor does not take you out of the good books of God. Giving to the poor does not put you in the good books of God. It's just an act of benevolence that has nothing to do with approval or the hand of the Almighty God in your life. That's a message for another day. I don't want to go into that. It's a whole message, but it's something we'll look at at some other time. Now, they were saying this should have been given to the poor. Another thing I want to say, and Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She has wrought a good work on me. Meaning that gift was not meant to the poor, though it would have benefited the poor. And that's one mistake people make. It's not everything God gives to you that is meant for the poor. Some are meant for God, while some are meant for the poor. Sometimes, of what God has given to you, the poor have no portion in it. And you must discern the portion of God and the portion of the poor. Have you heard the scripture? Give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and to God the things that belong to God. That scripture is one of the most abused scriptures I've ever heard in my life. They even use it to vindicate using occultic power. They say, let's give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. They use it to even validate the worship of Satan. No, what it's simply saying is, whatever belongs to God, don't give it to another person. Let it be given to God. Now, Jesus was telling them, why are you disturbing her and trying to get what belongs to me to the poor? It does not belong to the poor. This belongs to God. And why trouble her? For she has wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And wheresoever you will, you may do them good. But me have ye not always. Also meaning, the opportunity to give to the poor is endless. The opportunity to give to God is closed. It's a short window. And you may never, ever in your entire life have such an opportunity again. So what Jesus is saying is, when you see the window to give to God, leave the poor. Because the poor's window don't close. It's always open. Settle with God first. That's what we're saying, the kingdom first. So even when it comes to the poor and the kingdom, the kingdom first. Why? The poor you will always have to give. God, you may never have an opportunity to do a good work on God in your entire life again. There are windows that come and they open and they shut. Now, back to what we're reading. In verse 8, she has done what she could. She's come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial for her. In the Luke translation, the Sanhedrin said she was a sinner. And when Jesus went further, he said, Her sins which are many are forgiven. Now this woman came to address a pressing need in God's kingdom first. Obviously, if she sold what she had, she had needs in her life that she would have used it to address. But she didn't even think of her own need. The Bible says the kingdom first. It didn't say don't think of your need. It said kingdom first, then your own needs. But here, she visited the kingdom need first and total. She committed to Jesus' burial, which he needed to complete his task. God has needs. And it's important for you to find out what his needs are and seek after those needs and address those needs 
When that happens, everything you need in your entire life, God will address it. It will bring you the total package. Now, this woman, if she approached Jesus and she was to make a request, she's a prostitute, she's a sinner. The best she will ask for is that her sins will be forgiven. But do you know what Jesus said to her and to the Sanhedrin? He addressed the need of her soul. Now he said, now they looked at her as a wayward woman. He told them, whenever you preach in your synagogue, as from today, say Pharisees, Sadducees, all of you, talk about her, not as a prostitute, as a woman that prepared the Lord for his burial. Now, I don't know what she can give to the Pharisees that will ever make them preach well of her. I don't know. Never. She herself will never request for that. The Lord said, that must be done. Number two, well, obviously, if she was to ask of the Lord, she will ask for forgiveness of sins because she knows she is a great sinner. And the Lord said, all she did ask, all her sins are forgiven. Wow. Then he went ahead to give her a spiritual package. So the spiritual package is the gospel on earth and in heaven must talk about her. The emotional package, when you're in your synagogue and everybody's gathered, give her a seat not far from you on the high table and tell the congregation, including women that she has destroyed their marriages, that this woman wrote a good work on God. Oh my goodness, Jesus Christ. That is an emotional package that brings her honor in the face of degradational and a total shame and reproach. When people of the eldership of a city call a woman a sinner, and when they are not preaching, they have to put out the high table and say, oh, please, let's talk about this great, mighty, and powerful woman. The woman, goodness me, I don't know what else you can ask for. That is what seeking the kingdom of God first will bring into the life of a person. It will address every single need, issue. If she had a health challenge, it would have been addressed. Obviously, she didn't have any health challenge. If she had any issue, it would be addressed. And not only that, it will address what you will never, ever dare to think of asking of the Lord. And like I said, in the book of um, 2 Kings chapter 4 about Solomon, in chapter 3, when Solomon slaughtered a thousand bulls, and the Lord appeared to him and said, Solomon, what do you want? What can I do for you? I keep saying it when Jesus was traveling to Jericho, the blind man that was crying and shouting, oh Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. The Bible says, Jesus stopped in his procession, sent for the man who was blind. He asked him, what do you want? That's a monumental, that's an eternal disaster. When a man stands before the Almighty and asks the obvious. He said, Lord, that I may regain my sight. It looks like a good request. But seeing what Solomon asked, the Lord said, Solomon, what do you want? He said, give me a wise and an understanding heart that I may judge your people so that you can fulfill your pleasure in them. Then God said, because, you know, I know you're a human being. I know you're a king. Meaning, God knows what you want to ask. If you're single, you're a lady, you're a man, you're in your 40s, he knows you want marriage. If you're in your 40s, you're married, you're yet to have a kid, he knows you want to have a kid. If you're a businessman, your business is down, he knows you want a revival of your business. If you are um, trying to chase a contract, they're denying you, he knows you want that contract. If you're trying to travel, you want a visa, he knows when he appears, he knows you want that visa. And he told Solomon, because you did not ask the obvious, but you asked for me to have my way, meaning you considered me first. Now I have granted what you asked. I have added the obvious that you did not ask. For now on Solomon, now listen to what he gives to Solomon. I've given you long life, peace with your enemies, 
He said, riches. Now, if Solomon asked for riches, he would say, Lord, give me riches that will be richer than all the kings of the earth. God said, riches that there has been no king like you, riches that there will be no king like unto you. Now, Solomon can't ask that. Never. He can only ask for his time to be the greatest. I've made you the greatest in your time. I've made you the greatest ahead of time. Wow. That is the total package I'm talking about. You can assess it by addressing God's need first in your life before your need. I'm not saying discard your need. I'm saying let his need have priority. You know, in life, life there are priorities in life depending on your profession, depending on where you live, depending on um, what you do. In life, there are six basic order that are prioritized in your life. This has to do with God. This has to do with your spouse. This has to do with your children. This has to do with your work. I didn't say job. Work. Job is what you do to eat and drink. Work is what you are endowed to do that gives you a living. You have your work. You have the ministry. And then you have your church. Of this order, God is number one. Your work is number two. Your spouse, number three. Your children, number four. Not your children before your spouse. Your children, number four. Your ministry, number five. Then the church is number six. The church is the last. Your work is more important than the church. I'm the pastor of a church, so I'm not running down the church, the general assembly. Your work, what you are endowed to do, that ends you a living. That's why Jesus said, it is better to do good on the Sabbath. He said, which of you will not take your camel, that is work, to go and give it a drink on the Sabbath? That means if work is not prioritizing on the Sabbath, you mustn't work. You should be in the synagogue from morning till night. He said, no, it is good. So if you're a medical doctor, it is better you are in the hospital saving lives on the Sabbath than you are in church if you are not on off. That's another message for another day. But it's important for you to know that there are priorities, there are orders in your life. God says his kingdom, his need first. You say, oh, is God not church? No, Abraham had God. There was no church in his days. Enoch walked with God. There was no church in his days. The church is 2,000 years. These are men that lived 4,000 years ago. They walked with God. Some of their records, Moses parted the Red Sea. No church has parted the any sea, even a, a stream. No church, no man of God. In the last 1,000, no man has parted a stream. Moses parted a sea of 1,000 meters deep at the center of the Red Sea. He had God. There was no church. Uh, Joshua parted the river Jordan. He had God. There was no church. The church even has not been able to part a swimming pool. How much more a stream or a river? No, please, let's not even go to sea. Oh, no, let's not even go there. Elijah raised the dead. Most of the claims of raising the dead, they're all scams. Raise the dead back to life. That was God with him. The Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. He didn't say he was in a church. God and the church are not the same. Even the church, that physical building is not really the church. God does not dwell in a building made with hands. It's just a fellowship center where we gather to learn certain things, both of God and of the ministry. But like I said, that's for another day. I'll leave for another time. It's still coming. We'll address it um, later on. Amen. So another example. So this woman got a total package by addressing God's need first. Now, if we go to 1 Kings 17, and I read from verse 8, 1 Kings 17 to verse 8, the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and there dwell. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was gathering, there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord 
Leave it, God leave it. I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first for me first and bring it to me and after make for thee and thy son. Now Elijah never said she shouldn't make for herself and her son. He said, mine first. Maybe some people read it upside down. They think Elijah said, give everything to me. No, 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 no. I said, you're going to gather the cake and everything you're doing. Address my hunger first. Then address the hunger of you and your son second. For thou seeth the God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Wow, what a miracle, my goodness. So she just kept taking flour, and it kept filling of its own accord, Jesus Christ. She kept taking the oil, and it kept filling of its own accord, not for one day, for six months. She would take, but how did she do that? She gave God first. I was talking to a minister of God, and he was talking about their building project in church, and he told me what he has done towards the building project. He's given up a lot of things. And I said, when that building is erected, it's going to glorify you, not God. God can never be glorified by a cathedral, never. God is not glorified by crowd, never. Many crowds follow Jesus and they turn their backs from following him and God was still glorified in Jesus' life. So if the crowd glorified God and they turned away from Jesus, the Bible says over 5,000 turned away from him and that was what glorified God and you need to understand this, then God would not have been glorified in the life of Jesus. Jesus went further. When the 5,000 left and the 120 left, he turned to the 11. He said, you are free to go, for my Father is still with me. So listen to this. God is not glorified by a beautiful, magnificent church building. We need it to have fellowship comfortably. We need it. But God is not glorified. That glorifies the pastor. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. It's as simple as as that. Displayed on the screen is diverse information on how you can interact and reach out to us. Take advantage of it and I'll be expecting to hear from you. Till I come your way again same time next week, I want to tell you don't give up. Faith works. It's working and it will work in your life. God bless you.